Hello, I wanted to welcome everybody. I'm Dr. Bianca Adair, the CIA Resident Intelligence Officer here at the University of Texas at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Uh, today we have, as part of our Brumley uh, speaking series, we have uh, Kim Gaddis, who we'll get, have an introduction to in just a moment. But before we get to that, I wanted to remind those of you, or at least inform those of you, a little bit more about the Brumley program. Uh, this is part of the Brumley Next Generation Fellows Program, which provides research, training, and men 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 mentorship opportunities to exceptional graduate students at UT Austin. The Strauss Center currently has 11 Brumley Fellows and three senior fellows. Each graduate student selected to be a fellow is linked to one of the Strauss Center's many current research programs, and each fellow is paired with a distinguished scholar. Under the scholar's guidance and backed with the financial support from the Strauss Center, each fellow conducts his or her own research. One of the goals of the program is to prepare the next generation of leaders to help develop solutions to the most pressing public policy challenges. One of, the, one of these exceptional students that is part of the Brumley Fellows Program is sitting next to me with Ruby Bledslow. Ruby is the second year Master of Global Policy student at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. She graduated magnum cum laude from Middlebury College where she earned a BA in International and Global Studies with a focus on Middle East and Arabic. Ruby speaks four languages and has lived and worked in the Middle East. At the LBJ School, she specializes in diplomacy and national security, and her research, research interests include the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and counterterrorism. As a fellow, she works with me. And not only that, for those of you that don't know her, she's also a wonderful person. And our, her colleagues, peers, as well as the faculty, absolutely love her. So I'll hand it over to Ruby. Thank you so much for your kind words, Dr. Adair. Um, well, welcome everyone. I'm really, really glad you're here to hear uh, Kim Gladys speak. I uh, have the honor to introduce her. So Kim Gladys is a contributing writer for The Atlantic Magazine and a non-resident senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. During her 20 year tenure as a journalist for the BBC, she covered the war between Israel and Hezbollah for which she and her team won an Emmy, uh, an Emmy for international coverage. She has also reported for the Financial Times and the Volksprint. She's the author of Black Wave, which I have here, um, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the 40 year rivalry that unraveled culture, religion, and collective memory in the Middle East. Um, also author of the, the New York Times bestseller, The Secretary, a journey with Hillary Clinton from Beirut to the heart of American power. Um, she serves on the board of trustees of the American University of Beirut, her alma mater, and on the board of directors of the Organization of Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism, Arij. Uh, she was born and raised in Beirut, and she's joining us from Beirut, Lebanon um, right now. So please um, welcome, yeah, join me in welcoming Kim Gladys. Thank you so so much, uh, Ruby, and thank you, uh, Bianca, for this great uh, welcome. Thank you for having me uh, speak to, to all of you. And um, I was delighted to meet some, some of the students uh, earlier um, this evening. It's evening where I am in, in, um, in, in Beirut and had an informal chat. Um, and I'm delighted to be speaking to you this um, uh, this evening from Beirut uh, for this talk that I titled From the Iranian Revolution to the Kabul Withdrawal. As um, Ruby very kindly pointed out, um, I have written this book, which she very, you know, uh, helpfully um, brought up to the screen so you can all, you can all see. And Bianca had some great words to say um, as well. Um, so I'm going to be taking you through some of the key themes of, of this book and tying them to what we're seeing unfold around us uh, today, and then we'll take some questions um, at the end. But I actually had a quick question for, for Ruby first. Where did you work in the Middle East? What were you, where were you based? What were you doing? Yeah, I, I worked at King's Academy in Jordan. Oh. Um, yeah, and, and travel across the Middle East, but that's where I was for. Oh. That's great. That's and if you don't mind, just a quick reminder uh, for attendees. Um, I know there are a lot of interesting things that Kim will say. So if you mind, if you don't mind, just type in your questions in the chat um, and we'll get to them at the end in the Q&A section. Thank you. Yes, that's a good reminder. Um, the chat box for the questions and then 
um, Bianca and, and, and Ruby will choose the easiest ones and uh, field them to me. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I can take any questions um, you have. But let me start with the most recent events, which was the um, withdrawal from, from Kabul. The withdrawal from Kabul, which happened in August, was the US withdrawal from Kabul and the takeover of uh, Kabul by the Taliban was really an event that grabbed the headlines that um, people stood up and paid attention to from the region, from the US. Um, this was a uh, US uh, military presence that had gone on since 2001, described as a forever war, uh, which President Biden and before him, President Trump wanted to bring an end to. The manner in which it unfolded, of course, uh, raised a lot of questions. Did it have to happen this way? Did it have to happen? Couldn't we have stayed? Why didn't we leave earlier? Those are questions that people would have asked themselves in the US. And they're all valid um, questions, of course, and we can, we can talk to them towards the end of my talk and in the questions. But what's interesting to remark upon is beyond the questioning within the US are, of course, the questions that it raised around the world. I grew up in Beirut during the Civil War. I lived in the US for a while, and then uh, I'm back here now where it is home, but where we're also going through one of the worst crises, economic crises, uh, as, the world, as the World Bank described it, one of the worst economic crises in the last 150 years. It's to live in its home. And yet, despite everything that we are going through in this country and that we've been going through over the last couple of years, I woke up on the 15th of August as the Taliban were closing in on Kabul with really deep angst within me. I hadn't been as anxious in two years as when I saw um, the rushed uh, exit of Afghans desperately fleeing. And as I saw the Taliban uh, approaching Kabul. And you may wonder why, you know, I'm living in Beirut, I'm not in Afghanistan. Um, we have our own problems here, but it is because of what I would describe as the butterfly effect of geopolitics. Every American action brings with it a reaction or a consequence. That's why there is concern in Riyadh or in Dubai or in Jordan as well about this withdrawal and what it says about US power, about US vision, about US um, resolve. And President Biden may well be proven right in his decision uh, to bring this military presence to, to an end. But in the short term, there are a lot of questions. And by consequence, there are a lot of aspects of the ramifications that US policymakers have to come to grips with as they engage with their allies, but also their foes. As the Biden administration talks about deprioritizing the Middle East, what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, does that mean not paying attention? Or does that mean bringing it back to the size that it should have? Because the Middle East has had an outsized um, presence in the minds and files and folders of American policymakers. But can you ignore the Middle East as you focus on the competition with China? Or is the Middle East part of that chessboard as well? I would posit that it's the latter. But whatever American policymakers 
do. It's very important to be informed about the context in which they're operating so that they can not only understand the problem, but that they can also better formulate policy and have the historical depth to form these policies that can better serve national US national security interests in the future. And that's what I try to do in my, in my writing as I also link larger global issues together. I often take Lebanon as the starting point and then I end up you know, talking about American politics or I start in the Middle East and I talk about worldwide governance because I do think that it's important to realize that a lot of the problems that we're grappling with are not just specific to us, whether it's Lebanon or whether it's the US. There are specificities, of course, in each uh, country, but a lot of these problems are global. Governance and rule of law are becoming global issues to tackle. Climate change, of course, is something we all have to deal with. Migration is, is an issue that we all have um, to deal with. And so to be able to better understand these, these, these issues, that policymakers have to formulate solutions to or answers to. I try to um, go to the heart of some misconceptions that um, the West and the US have about um, the region. And there are three key misconceptions that I think are important to address. The first one is that Saudi Arabia and Iran the two countries at the heart of the story that I tell, that Saudi Arabia and Iran were not always enemies. You know, all the headlines today, well, right now today, some of the headlines are about how Saudi Arabia and Iran are trying to engage and talking to each other. Depending on how closely you follow the Middle East, you may have seen that. But the headlines for the last few decades have been all about Saudi Arabia and Iran and the conflict and the rivalry and crises but there was a time not that long ago um, in the 60s and 70s, you know, you may not have been born, but your parents were around and your grandparents were around. And so I consider that to be not that long ago. We're not talking, you know, two centuries ago. Um, there was a time when Saudi Arabia and Iran were allies. They might have been a bit competitive. They might have been a bit um, jealous of each other uh, as, you know, great nations or, you know, big nations do, whether it's France and, uh, and, and Germany, whether it's um, you know, the US and Europe, whether it's New Zealand and, uh, and Australia, there's always tension. But Saudi Arabia and Iran in the 60s and 70s and 50s were friendly rivals that sorted out their problems on a state-to-state -state level. Even more than that, they were twin pillars in US policy in the Middle East twin pillars in US efforts to contain the Soviet Union. And that tells you something about what the relationship was like between Iran and the US. The King of Saudi Arabia, custodian of the two holy sites of Islam, a dominantly Sunni kingdom with a Shia minority was friendly with the Shah of Iran, custodian of the Shia faith, ruler of a dominantly Shia country. So a Sunni leader and a Shia leader, perfectly happy to be friendly, to be working together in the region, to visit each other the Shah of Iran went to the Hajj in Mecca. Um, um, Saudi royals would holiday in, uh, in Iran. That was then. And then, of course, came the fateful year of 1979, which I will get to in a moment. But before that, I want to talk to you about the second misconception. And you may have guessed it already a little bit as I talk about the Saudi Sunni king and the Shia Shah of Iran, Sunni and Shia, perfectly fine, perfectly able to work together. That's because 
Sunnis and Shias have not always been killing each other. They've not always been at each other's throats. Those are, again, the headlines of the day. Um, it's a little, it has subsided a little bit today. We're not at the paroxysm of sectarian violence that we saw in 2006, 2007 in Iraq after the US invasion of Iraq, but we're still seeing this violence in Afghanistan, for example, where the Taliban, a Sunni group, um, or well, they've not said that they've done it, but under their watch today, <clears throat> we have seen renewed <clears throat> attack against Shia mosques in Afghanistan. But there was a time when um, Sunnis and Shias were where, or let, let me say, where um, the, 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 the life in the Middle East was not dominated by these headlines about sectarian killings. Now, of course, if you study history, if you study the Middle East, if you study religion, you know that the schism between Sunnis and Shias is real, that it happened um, in the wake of the death of Prophet Muhammad, and it was a dispute about who should take on the mantle. And there were some who thought that it should be his closest advisor, and there were some who thought it should be his closest um, relative. And that's how this dispute started. And there was a civil war within um, Islam in, in the year, in the decades following the death of Prophet Muhammad. And there have been um, moments of violence in the centuries that followed. But I would posit that over the course of history, Sunnis and Shias have probably killed each other maybe less than Catholics and Protestants. And I, I want you to think of that. And I want you to think about how we, we fall into this narrative of the other. The other over there whose religion we don't understand, whose uh, culture we don't get, it's so foreign to us. Um, when I look at Northern Ireland and I look at the divisions that continue today between Catholics and Protestants, I'm actually quite taken aback because in some ways it's worse than some of what we're dealing with in, in this region in terms of how little contact there is between Catholics and Protestants. They go to separate schools. There's a wall going across Belfast. Um, you know, we have mixed schools here. There are no, there are areas that are predominantly more this or more that. But, you know, we have Shia kids who come to the Christian school in my neighborhood. Um, and, you know, uh, perhaps, um, you know, Sunni kids as well. I, I don't know. So, so I, I just want you to think about how you frame the question or the problem. Because if you come and as a policymaker later on when you graduate, when you move into policy or other work that you will do, if you come at this problem by saying, this is so foreign, this is so different, uh, it's always been like this. Sunnis and Shias have always killed each other. It's always going to be like that. And you immediately limit the types of solutions that you come up with. Then you end up misdiagnosing the problem. And by extension, um, you are not giving it the chance that it deserves to not solve the problem yourself. No one is asking the United States to solve the historical schism between Sunnis and Shias about who is the rightful heir to the prophet. But when you're looking at issues like Iraq or when you're looking at um, disputes in, in, um, in Pakistan, if you think, well, there's no solution to this, then you're instantly limited in how you diagnose the problem and what you are able to do with your policy prescriptions. Now, when you have the rise of religious intolerance, um, which we saw in the wake of the year 1979, and I will explain in a moment, but I really want to first address these misconceptions. 
when you have the rise of religious intolerance and this Sunni Shia sectarian, the weaponization of sectarianism um, really started also after 1979. So again, it's very recent. It's just barely a generation. Um, when you have the rise of these sectarian hatreds, when within your own communities, I just have to warn you that my dog is trying to chase a fly in the background. So if you saw me see things crashing, um, don't be alarmed. It's just the dog. <laughs> um, um, so, <laughs> so when you have the rise of sectarian hatreds and sectarian violence, and you start within your own community of seeing people who are your neighbors as the other, because that's what the current geopolitical trends dictate, because that's what regional powers dictate, then you are also instantly feeding a wider wave of intolerance because uh, the otherization doesn't stop at, oh, well, he's Shia, but you know I love his taste in music. No, it starts to seep into every aspect of your life. And that's the third misconception that people have about this region. There was a time, again, not to repeat myself, not that long ago, where this region was not defined by intolerance or extremism or censorship or fatwas against intellectuals or assassinations of activists. Uh, well, actually, let me caveat the assassination of activists. They, there were assassination of activists because that's just the the history of the world where depending on what your activism is at the time it was the leftists uh before 1979 there was you know um there was you know the, the there were liberation movements and um and 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 there were assa political assassinations but there was no um censorship and assassinations based on what you had written you know we all remember the fatwa that khomeini uh issued against salman rushdie for a book that kind of thing did not happen then, not in the name of religion. It happened in the name of nationalism or anti, you know, the, the fear of communism and, and so on. And, you know, of course we could get into a discussion about, is it better to do it in the name of religion or is it better to do it in the name of, you know, nationalism? Um, that's a whole different discussion. But suffice it to say that what I want to really emphasize is that um, I really want you to think of this region as one that was transformed by one specific year, one pivotal year, where suddenly over the course of you know, several months and then several years, Saudi Arabia and Iran were no longer allies, where over the course of, within the span of just a few years, um, Sunnis and Shias were at each other's throats where all of a sudden you were having fatwas against people for their books, for their music, for their dancing. And that year, 1979, was a pivotal year in the region, but also in the world. It was also the year that was um, the precursor to the election of President Reagan. It was the rise of Thatcherism in the UK. Um, it was a year that shook the world in many ways that we think about now when we look back, we understand it better. But specifically in the Middle East, it was a pivotal year. And because of the three misconceptions that I outlined, which are also three problems that the region has to deal with today, I find that the year 1979 is pivotal in ways that other years are not. Because whereas, you know, the fall of the Ottoman Empire or the, um, the creation of Israel or the Six Day War or the coup in Iran, all those events were important and pivotal and they changed the course of history or of politics. They did not unleash a change in culture and in society and in people's understanding of their identity and of who they are and of how they understand their religion. That's why 1979 is such a pivotal year because it did 
all of that. It changed who we are, it hijacked our collective memory, and it changed our understanding of our past. And when you don't understand your own past, you cannot build a better future. Now, briefly, what did 1979 bring with it? It brought three key events. The return from exile of Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, who had been in exile since the 60s, uh, partly in Iraq and then in Paris. Khomeini returns to Iran in February, at the height of the Iranian revolution, which had been simmering for months already since 77. And he hijacks what was ostensibly a leftist revolution and turns it into an Islamic revolution. Because remember, political Islam, Islam as a weapon, religion as a weapon, that was not what people were talking about in the 60s and 70s. It was all about the Cold War, it was about the Soviet Union, it was about the danger of communism, and it was in some cases fear of the left. And you had liberation movements from Angola to Cuba to the Palestinians. And that's what was animating a lot of the revolutionaries in Iran, the desire to remove what was seen as a pro-Western despot. So when the Shah was, was thrown out and Khomeini hijacked the revolution very cunningly and turned it into an Islamic revolution and turned Iran into an Islamic Republic, in the year 19, by the end of the year 1979, Iran was an Islamic Republic. You know who was relieved? The Saudis. The Saudis were initially relieved that, although they were sad to see their friend the Shah removed, they were very worried that he was going to be replaced by a communist regime. And so when they saw a man who spoke their language, who talked about the Quran and talked about the Sharia, and talked about conservative values and talked about women having to veil. They thought, oh, we can do business with him. You know, we can deal with this. Except it didn't turn out exactly like that. And it took them a little bit of time to understand what was really going on there. And I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But the second event that happened in 1979, of course, was the siege of the Holy Mosque in Mecca by Saudi zealots. And it was happening at the same time as the Iran hostage crisis um, in Tehran, where Americans were being held hostage at the embassy. And initially, because of the, the, the all, all the events that had happened in, in Iran, initially people thought, well, maybe the Iranians have laid siege. You know, Iranian activists, revolutionaries have laid siege to the mosque in Mecca. But the Saudis themselves had a problem internally with their own zealots. And a very conservative country ruled by a conservative royal family, uh, there was still a sense that the country was not conservative enough in the eyes of some. And those zealots wanted to push the Saudi royal family to impose religious law even further. And they laid siege to the mosque in, um, in Mecca. And that worried the Saudis because they're supposed to be the custodians of the Holy Mosque of, of Mecca. So they have two problems. Their reputation has been tarnished and they suddenly realize they have internal opposition. And then the third event that happens in 1979 is the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And um, that presents the Saudis with an opportunity where they set themselves center stage in the battle against the godless communists in, um, in, in Afghanistan. And with the, um, with the, um, with the help, or, or they helped you know, the, the Americans and the Pakistanis to fight what was at the time this, this good war, um, they are able to um, you know, burnish their credentials again as leaders of the Muslim world fighting the good war for a Muslim country against you know, the, the communists. And they're able to solve another problem, which is to export their zealots to go fight in, in Afghanistan. And as I mentioned, um, there was a second problem that arose that year. So not only did the Saudis realize that they were 
you know, undermined in their role as custodians of the two holy sites and leaders of the Muslim world. But their initial relief at seeing Khomeini take over in Iran suddenly was shaken by the realization that Khomeini had grand designs beyond Iran, beyond even the Shia community. He wanted to be the leader of the Muslim world. And if it was not the leader of the Muslim world, it was at least the leader of those who wanted to fight against America, against imperialism, and um, the Saudis realized that they have a problem. A rivalry is born and it becomes a mortal rivalry between two countries that were once allies, two countries that did not have religion feature as an element in how they approached state-to-state -state relations or how they approached their foreign relations. The Saudis, some of you may know or will point out, did spend you know, their money building mosques here and there even before 1979. Saudi largesse was already being seen in countries like Pakistan, but it was you know, a haphazard effort. It was not a methodical effort to proselytize or export anything. But 1979, again, that pivotal, fateful year, changes that because the Saudis realize that the Iranians are going for the mantle of leaders of the Muslim world. And what better way to um, uh, push back against the Iranians who are exporting their revolution to places like Lebanon or Pakistan, where there is a Shia community, who are railing against the Saudis as not conservative enough, as American lackeys, who are even challenging their role as custodians of the two holy sites by causing a raucous, raucous at, at the pilgrimage in Mecca um, every year. What better way to push back against the Iranians and Khomeini, but by diminishing this new feature in the region by diminishing Iran and Khomeini to being just Shias. They don't represent the Muslim world. They don't represent the region. They don't represent Arabs. They're just one thing. They just represent a small group of Shias, speaking of Khomeini. And so the Saudis start deploying sectarian language to push back against Khomeini's ambitions. They start whipping out um, pamphlets that describe Shias almost as heretics. And of course, in return, um, Iranian state-led Shiaism does the same, pushing back against the Saudis. And so across the region, from Pakistan to Lebanon, you have a slow spread of the weaponization of sectarian language, sectarian narrative, and eventually, of course, it leads to violence. So I've given you um, the three misconceptions that I think are important to keep in mind when you think about the Middle East, when you think about Sunnis and Shias, when you think about what is possible to resolve. Um, you know, can the Saudis and the Iranians ever sit down together? Yes, they can. It's not easy, but um, it is possible. I've given you the three big events of 1979 and how those seemingly um, completely independent events become completely intertwined. And the two problems that that year um, really pushes forward, um, the Saudi insecurity and their prestige that's taken a hit, um, Khomeini who wants to export um, the revolution, and how those two issues then also intertwine in spreading dynamics from the weaponization of sectarian narratives, sectarian identities, and that then leads to the rise of increasing intolerance, cultural and religious. 
Um, I want to bring you all the way up to today and then take questions, um, which, which uh, Ruby and, and Bianca will, will help us uh, field. The decades that follow are really marked by a variety of events, but I summarize them in four trends. The first decade of the 80s is marked by war and conflict. You have the war in Afghanistan, of course. You also have the Iran-Iraq war which very conveniently for the Saudis, they see as a way to contain Khomeini's ambitions outside of his borders. The 90s is marked by the taunt between the Saudis and the Iranians, which goes again to one of the misconceptions I told you about. Saudis and the Iranians don't have to be at each other's throat. We don't necessarily talking about peace, but we're talking about detente which is what they're trying again today. Uh, and it's marked by detente because they've suddenly found a common enemy. Remember, of course, that in 1990, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. And Saddam Hussein is, of course, seen as an enemy and a threat to Iran because they've just been at war uh, with Iraq throughout the 80s. And suddenly the Saudis think, hey, this guy who we thought was able to contain the Iranians is actually maybe a threat to us. What are his ambitions beyond Kuwait? Is he going to invade Saudi Arabia next? And so the Saudis and the Iranians suddenly grow closer in the face of um, Iraq's, you know, and Saddam Hussein's um, regional ambitions. But unfortunately, during the 80s, the seeds of intolerance have been sown. And neither the Saudis nor the Iranians do anything to um, undo this intolerance that they have both sown from, you know, the rise of um, uh, intolerant teachings in religious schools in Pakistan to the spread of the veil in Egypt in ways that Egypt had never seen before. Um, you know, you had singers and, um, and belly dancers and actresses renounce their art. You had attacks in the 90s against intellectuals, including the um, Nobel laureate for literature, Naguib Mahfouz. Those seeds of intolerance sown in the 80s continue to grow um, in the 90s, unfortunately. The decade that follows is an interesting reversal of, of events where, whereas the 80s was marked by Iran um, and the rise of extremism by Shias, state by sort of, you know, Shia extremism uh, encouraged by Iran and its, you know, proxy groups like Hezbollah in Lebanon. In the 80s, you had hijackings um, you had a hostage taking in, 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 in Lebanon, very unfortunate incidents by groups um, backed by Iran. The 2000s, after 2000, and of course with 9-11, you suddenly see the rise of extremism by Sunnis. Um, you see extremism appear across uh, the world. You see the rise of the Taliban in the 90s, of course, the 9-11 incidents, and then uh, all the way up to today, the rise of, uh, of ISIS or ISIL, as some people um, describe it. And of course, in 2003, you have the US invasion of Iraq. And then I'm going to wrap up and, and talk a little bit about the US role in, in all this and take your questions. The US invasion of Iraq has its problems. Um, you know, that's the separate debate about, you know, military intervention and should we do it or not, or Afghanistan, et cetera. But what it does specifically in the region is it by removing Saddam Hussein, which was, who was seen as, as a threat uh, by Iran. And just before that, by removing the Taliban in Afghanistan, you know, the, the Iranians were kind of sandwiched between the Taliban and, um, and, and Saddam Hussein. With the removal of those two, Iran suddenly thinks, hey, you know, I've got some room to maneuver here. And they see an opportunity to um, redo the score of the Iran-Iraq war, where they think, 
you know, they, they lost and they had to agree to a ceasefire and they had to, uh, you know, they paid a very, very, very heavy price, the Iranians, for that, for that war. And they felt abandoned by the world, besieged by the world. They saw that everyone was helping Saddam Hussein. You know, more than a million Iranians, including civilians, not just fighters, uh, died in that war. And it's this grievance that continues to drive a lot of Iranian actions today. The sense that if they don't fight, if they're not always on the offensive, they're going to find themselves under siege again by, by everyone, including by their neighbors and, and by the US. And then the final decade that we're looking at is the 2010s, the noughts, where you have Arab uprisings across the region, which you would think, and I thought, um, are an expression only of rejection of dictatorships, dictators that were often backed by, by the West, of course. Um, but what I found as I dug deeper is that it was also um, a, that, that the Saudi-Iran rivalry was also a player in how these uprisings unfolded and how they were hijacked, either by Saudi Arabia in Egypt or by the Iranians in Saudi Arabia. Because the Saudis and the Iranians are locked into this dynamic and they're locked in this dynamic with the US as well, because the US is at the heart of a lot of these events. I have wanted to focus my uh, writing and my analysis on the role that Saudi Arabia and Iran play, because we're often too focused on the US and everything that the US does wrong or should be doing or shouldn't be doing. But it's important to understand that countries in the region have agency, that they drive some of the agenda, and that very often the Saudis are playing the Americans against Iran. And very often the Iranians are playing the Saudis or um, keeping in mind the scoreboard that they have with both Saudi Arabia and the US. So that's how the US features in this. And that's why going back to my opening statement about the importance of understanding the ramifications of the Kabul withdrawal, the Afghanistan withdrawal, whether you support it, whether you don't, it's important to understand the ramifications. Today in the region, the Saudis, the Iranians, and their friends in, on each side are looking at this US withdrawal from Afghanistan and thinking, where do the chips fall now? To my advantage or to my rival's advantage? Is the US on the out or is the US actually trying to decrease its military footprint in a faraway country so that it can be more strategic about how it looks at the Middle East and where it positions itself? Is it withdrawing from the whole region so that it can focus on China only in Asia? Or is it trying to give the Middle East its right amount of attention because it's you know, taken up too much attention of past administrations and policymakers so that it can better balance the strategic competition um, with China? I think those are questions that are driving a lot of the thinking in Washington today in the Biden administration. Uh, driving some of the criticism of the administration's policies as well. And I would say that in conclusion, when you look at the region, you must do um, two things. One is understand that countries in the region have agency, but that they are also watching America's every movement to determine what their next step is. Is Hezbollah um, just looking at this Kabul withdrawal and thinking, oh, interesting. Well, yeah, the Taliban are back in Kabul. Okay, let's carry on with our whatever we're doing here. Or are they thinking, interesting, you know, America's uh, just, um, you know, withdrawn from Afghanistan and the Taliban who have been patiently waiting for 20 years are back in power. Maybe if we bide our time, we can have the same result. Similarly, um, 
you know, America's allies in the region are asking themselves, what does that mean for us? Does that mean that America is going to withdraw and leave us to our fate? Or does that mean that it has just re, uh, reprioritized things in a way that it can focus on bigger strategic things, including um, the competition in China and how it plays out in the Middle East, and including strategic dialogue, for example, between the UAE and India as part of that strategic repositioning. So a lot of different strands for questions there. Um, I assume that they've been coming in and I'm going to leave it here and uh, turn it over to Ruby and, and Bianca uh, to tell me how difficult the questions are going to be from the audience. Well, we're going to have some good ones for you. I think first and foremost, just for everybody and it, uh, our mistake on that, if you do have questions, please put it in the Q&A uh, tab uh, so that we can, we'll start filtering through. Um, our first question is one that's a little on the historic side for you, Kim. Um, and it has to do with the commentary that you were noting, the 1990s was a period of detente between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. And I, I'm kind of curious about that in that, uh, we also know that during that period of time, uh, Ali Akbar Rafsanjani was actively in dialogue with the Saudis. And I'm curious yeah. how you, uh, and, and I went, the, the question in and of itself is based on, there's a question about that period of time, what's going on inside of Iran versus that competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And with Rafsanjani first in his presidency seeking outreach to include Saudi Arabia and the United States. At the same time, the new Supreme Leader Khamenei is trying to shore up his own power inside of Iran because he certainly was no match for Rafsanjani. I'm curious how that aspect of the, uh, the Iranian side of detente, how that plays in and how what you think about maybe how the Saudis viewed Rafsanjani's outreach and then when that was markedly cut off later by the late 1990s when uh, Khamenei exerts himself as someone who's no longer going to tolerate uh, different forms of outreach to include Saudi Arabia was done by Rafsanjani and also Khatami. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question and it goes to the heart of the problem which is that it's often about personalities and about current context. You know Rafsanjani knew very well that Iran was uh, you know, a broken country at the end of the Iran-Iraq war. And if it wanted to rebuild, it had to reintegrate the international community. It had to reach out to the US. It had to be able to talk to Saudi Arabia uh, on, in, in OPEC. It had to be able to export its oil again. And so Rafsanjani made, made a very smart, pragmatic, calculated move, which I think, you know, was also probably a reflection of his ability uh, to think bigger than, you know, Iran and the revolution possibly and, and Iran's, you know, um, or, or the Supreme Leader's uh, um, vision. But, and he was met on the other side by then Crown Prince open to the idea of, of dialogue. So it was a meeting of minds, of personalities and of circumstance. Right, so after Saddam invaded uh, Kuwait, it was, it was a matter of necessity for these two countries to come together. And it was the right time. And it was um, circumstances that brought them together. But in the background, Saudis will tell you, Saudi officials will tell you that throughout this period of detente, the hardline elements of the regime were continuing to, you know, build their forward bases. And I mean that uh, figuratively, they were still active with building, you know, spreading their tentacles across the region. And so the Saudis feel that they were fooled. And in fact, Mohammed bin Salman himself said, you know, my predecessors were fooled by Iranian smiles. We thought we were getting detente and they were just slyly continuing to do their work behind our backs. Um, and just one last uh, point. Um, um, so 
I also think that the detente, well, I don't think, I know, so I was just trying to remember that, that bit of information. Obviously, the detente was um, shattered by two things, um, well, three things. One, the invasion of Iraq by the US, un, you know, starts a new dynamic, starts a new chapter whereby some Iranians, including Qasem Soleimani, see an opportunity. And um, then it's the election of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who is a hardliner. And so you're no longer dealing with a Khatami, you're no longer dealing with a Rafsanjani. But even then, King Abdullah welcomes Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to Riyadh, or, or at least they meet somewhere, I can't remember where. So there was still efforts at detente, but what really does it is to find out that Iran's been building a secret nuclear program. That kind of takes, you know, brings everything, crashes everything. And so today, when we talk about detente, I think it's more of a pragmatic effort by the Saudis to position themselves as the pragmatic, uh, solution-oriented, positive uh, party to this rivalry that wants to talk with the Iranians, knowing full well that they probably won't get very far. Uh, but it's a smart move by the Saudis. I don't think the current talks are of any substance, because I think the Saudis are just too uh, weary uh, and wary of the Iranians, and the personalities are just too difficult at the moment. And I just, if, if I may, um, just do a quick note about something that did come into the chat box. That is a very smart comment about the Shah of Iran, who did not define his country's foreign policy by uh, Shia identity. And that's absolutely right. And I hope that was clear from what I was saying, that religion did not feature um, certainly not in, in Iran, in its foreign policy and how it was defined on the world um, stage and what the uh, revolutionary, uh, what the revolution did and the rise of Khomeini did was bring uh, fundamentalist Shiaism, state-led to the heart of foreign policy and, that what's and that's what drives um, uh, Iranian foreign policy today. Thank you so much for that note, Kim. Um, we have wonderful questions coming in. Make sure you type them in the Q&A box again, just as a reminder. Um, the first question comes from Will Walker. Uh, he says, you mentioned that the Saudis disseminated propaganda, casting Khomeini as a heretic for his Shia beliefs in order to undercut his claim to be the leader of the Muslim world. Um, he is curious if Sunnis would have accepted Khomeini as the leader of the Muslim world, even without the Saudi talking points. Uh, he thinks it seems like Khomeini was exclusively Shia, um, and because of that, um, the, the schism, the, the Sunni world would not have accepted him. How could Khomeini claim the lead in the whole Muslim world in 1979? Thanks, Will. So that's an excellent question, and it goes to the heart of one of the misconceptions that I talk about, which is that Sunnis and Shias were not always at each other's throat, and in fact, there was a lot of interconnection and transnational ties, including between Khomeini in the 60s and Abu Ala al Maududi, a Sunni Pakistani scholar who is the, 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 the uh, what's the word I'm looking for, who inspired, um, really inspired the writings of Sayyid Qutb in Egypt, who is seen as you know, the father of, of modern um, jihad. Uh, there, was a, there was a meeting in the 60s between Abu Al al Maududi and, um, and Khomeini, I believe in, in Mecca actually, at the Hajj. Those connections, that you know, um, exchange of ideas was not, was not uncommon. I, I want to emphasize again that intellectual connections, religious meetings um, were not uncommon. And our lives were not defined by sectarian identities. Even in the 80s, even as the Iran-Iraq war was unfolding, the narrative was not about sectarianism yet, not that at that level. I grew up in the civil war in Lebanon, and I hadn't really heard the words Sunnis and Shias um, until much, much later, until really it really came to our consciousness um, with, the Iran, with, with the US invasion of Iraq and sectarian violence that exploded then. But and, and just one more, one more point, what Khomeini was trying to do um, was appeal to those Muslims who did not want to be in the pro-American camp, who did not want to be in um, the Saudi 
uh, camp because they were, in his words, the lackeys of the, of the Americans. And in the immediate aftermath of the revolution, you know, Khomeini actually inspired a lot of people. And he was courted by the Sunni Muslim Brotherhood, which had been trying in places like Egypt to come to power and failed. And then they thought, hey, look, you know, it can be done. There's a Muslim theocracy in Iran. You know, maybe we can go ask for advice. And they did. They got on a plane from Egypt, from Algeria, from Tunisia, from Pakistan, and they went to visit Khomeini in Iran to ask for his counsel. And even if some of the records are correct, ask for his potential leadership of the wider, the vaster Muslim community. But um, Khomeini was not interested for various reasons, which, which I won't get into now. Uh, but that just goes to show you that these divisions are not clear cut. It's not binary. And even today, I, I will point out that Hamas, for example, the Palestinian militant group, which does look to um, Iran and to Khomeini, is Sunni. So even today, these, these divisions are not this clear cut. They're not, imp they're not, um, they're not hermetic. Uh, but for sure, um, you know, Khomeini could not claim to be the leader of the whole Muslim world, but he wanted to rally those who were against, um, you know, American, American politics and, and imperialism. Yeah, those are great insights. Thank you so much. And it actually is a perfect segue for our next question. Uh, David Johnson asks, what do you see as the end goal of Iran's strategy of using proxy groups like Hamas, as you mentioned, um, and now with that Hezbollah, and um, also you mentioned the instability in Afghanistan. Is that something that you you see or assess Iran looking at and in, in how to exploit those that, that instability? You know, I, I, I must confess, I'm always very honest and upfront when I don't know the answer to a question um, because, you know, I'm not all knowing. And I, I don't know actually what is Iran's end goal. I, I truly don't know. I'm not sure that it can be defined. I'm not sure that beyond being powerful, beyond having proxy militias, beyond, as they themselves say, you know, being in control of, you know, Arab capitals from Sana'a to Damascus to Beirut to Baghdad. I, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure that from, um, that, that beyond that, I understand what their project is. It, it certainly doesn't seem to be a very constructive project. And, uh, you know, I have a, a, a friend who's an expert on, on Iran and who's Iranian himself, who says, you know, instead of talking about the axis of evil, we should talk about the axis of destruction. Because what have the Iranians done that is helpful to Iraq or to Lebanon or to Syria um, beyond you know, uh, undermining governance, feeding corruption, and propping up militias that instill fear in people and end up being guilty of assassinating activists who are pushing for, uh, for, those exact, for the exact opposite, for governance, for rule of law, and for, and for justice. So, you know, from a purely pragmatic sort of raw power perspective, I would argue that, you know, that is their, their goal to, to, to be in power and to have power beyond their borders and to thwart American, you know, politics and American ambitions and American power in, in the region. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, it goes to the question about power. I mean, what is Vladimir Putin about? You know, I, I would ask the same question about him. You know, his economy is tanking, there's unemployment. Um, you know, I, I don't see it as a constructive way forward, but very often you have to accept that it's not very, you know, that dictators are not necessarily constructive. <laughs> Let's put it mildly. Yeah, thank you so much again. And I have read your book and um, you have a section on Syria, but Connie um, Hayham is wondering uh, how Syria fits into the picture that you have painted. And she's actually curious about Turkey too. I know you have a chapter in Khashoggi and how that, that those friendships kind of developed um, before his assassination. So would you mind mentioning how Syria fits in the picture in, in Turkey as well? 
Yes, of course. And it was interestingly, it was one of the chapters that stumped me most because, you know, as an author, when you have a thesis, you of course don't want to find out at some point after, you know, two years of working that you've just come across a fact that is going to undermine the whole project. But you also don't want to fit, um, you know, a square peg in a round hole, if that's the, the right expression. I always get it the wrong way around. Although I never understood why a square peg can't fit in a round hole. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, it can't fit if it's a bit smaller, but <laughs> sorry, on a tangent there. Um, so I, I, I was, I, I knew that it was part of the larger story because, um, you know, Iran and Saudi Arabia were part of this um, um, Iranian desire to see an anti-American camp um, uh, evolve or grow in the region. Um, you know, uh, Hafez al-Assad, the leader of, of, uh, of Syria at the time, was friendly to Khomeini from the very beginning. This was a marriage of convenience from the very beginning. When uh, Khomeini was expelled from Iraq in 1978, in August of 1978, just before he went to Paris, uh, I believe Bash uh, Hafez al-Assad offered to uh, welcome him in, in Syria. There were already exchanges. There was already, um, uh, you know, a meeting of, of the minds, and that only expanded and grew uh, during the 80s. And Syria, of course, stood by Iran, one of the few countries to stand by Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. So in a way, you could say that the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran existed at a simmering level within Syria. Syria was playing um, on you know, was playing both sides in some ways because it maintained friendly or cordial relations with Saudi Arabia, uh, but it was very much in the Iran camp. And there were, you know, cultural uh, centers that were being built. There was land that was being given to um, Iranians for, to the Iranians for expanding, um, you know, uh, uh, their uh, ability to bring pilgrims to Shia uh, pilgrimage sites in Damascus, but also beyond. So those ties were there. But what I was trying to figure out as I was doing my research is how did it figure today? And how did it figure in the uprisings? And how was it playing out? And I wasn't sure until I spoke to um, one of the characters or one of the people who ends up being a character in the book, Yasin Haj Saleh, who talks to me about his um, hometown of Raqqa. And for you who followed the news and the rise of ISIS or ISIL, you'll know that Raqqa was the, the capital of the caliphate. Uh, and by extension, this is something I have not addressed in the talk, it is the byproduct, ISIL meaning, is the byproduct of Saudi proselytizing outside of its borders and spreading uh, a ultra-literalist, ultra-orthodox, literalist, puritanical understanding of Islam. The difference, let me just have a little parenthesis here, the difference between how Saudi Arabia and Iran approached the export of things that defined them post-1979 is that in the, the Iranians do it in a very methodical state-led way, which produces proxy militias and cultural centers around you know, the Arab world or the Muslim world that answer to the Supreme Leader and which can therefore be called back and brought back if tomorrow the supreme leader decides that you know he's kind of done with this project and you know let's make peace with the world and he tells Hezbollah okay you know what you're you know you're off I'm calling you off you know you have to give in your weapons no more money Hezbollah would have a problem 
continuing because they're very much tied to um, the state in, in, in Iran, the current state, the Islamic state, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Whereas with Saudi Arabia, it's more of a checkbook diplomacy where they throw money at a problem and they fund some groups here and they fund some groups there and there are lots of unintended consequences. Not a lot of it is state-led, a lot of it is private-led, charities, etc. Which means that you have a mushrooming of groups who um, don't answer to Riyadh the way that Hezbollah answers to Tehran. And that's a problem because Saudi Arabia produces these byproducts and has no control over them. In fact, these groups would like to topple the House of Saud, whereas um, groups like Hezbollah or Shia militias in Iraq are very much there as a vanguard to protect the Iranian, the Iranian Republic, the Iranian Islamic Republic. And so going back to the answer about Raqqa, um, as Raqqa becomes the, the capital of the caliphate, I speak to Yassin Hajj Saleh, who reminds me of the history of Raqqa, where there are these two shrines that were claimed by Iran as Shia shrines, although they also have a Sunni history to them. Again, going back to the whole idea that these identities are not perfectly delineated. Um, these shrines were being visited by, by Sunnis in the past, and then you know, they become transformed in this narrative by the Iranian state and Iranian state-led enterprise builds these shrines around the, uh, build these mosques around the shrines in Raqqa, Shia shrines, Shia, very sort of Persian style mosques. And what is the first thing that the Islamic state does when it gets to Raqqa? It blows up the mosques. That's the first thing they do. And so it's a rivalry that plays out in Syria as Iran's project to, you know, project its power beyond its borders reaches Syria. And you have Shia militias that are coming from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from Lebanon. They're all fighting for Iran in Syria. And you have the Saudis sort of looking from the corner of their eye at ISIS, thinking, well, hmm. You know, they're giving the Iranians a bloody eye in Syria. Maybe we can close, you know, maybe we can turn a blind eye to the fact that, you know, we're also afraid of them and they might come for us. But if they're there in Syria fighting the Iranian militias and the Shia militias, you know, we're not going to do much to, um, to, to, fight, to fight ISIS until, of course, you know, um, you start getting threats within, within Saudi Arabia. So that's how Saudi Arabia's revolution civilian revolution, peaceful revolution, democratic revolution is hijacked by both Iran and Saudi Arabia in their rivalry and how it's completely undermined by, by this rivalry, unfortunately. It's something that Syrians did not anticipate, did not expect that their dreams and hopes for democracy would be crushed like that by, by Saudi Arabia and Iran and their own narrow interests. And on Turkey, Turkey is slightly sort of um, on the side. I, I don't address Turkey very much in the book other than in the Khashoggi um, sections because there is a separate rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Turkey that goes back to the Ottoman Empire, the days of the Ottoman Empire um, and sort of some hard feelings about, you know, why Saudi Arabia becomes the custodians of becomes the custodian of the two. L let me rephrase that to be very specific. Why the House of Saud becomes the custodian of the two holy sites of Mecca, whereas before it was part of the Ottoman Empire. And so there is a bit of a, you know, a rivalry there. And in fact, not to get too, too detailed, but I, I do write about it in the book. Um, at the time of the first Saudi state, which is the... Uh, which was born out of the alliance between the early Sauds and Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, after whom we sometimes name this strand of um, conservative exclusionary Islam, Wahhabism. The combination of these two, the House of Saud and the Wahhab and uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, gives birth to the first Saudi state, which is an irritant 
um, with its extremism actually at the time uh, for the Muslim, for the wider Muslim world. And the Ottomans are, you know, aggravated by it, and they eventually send in the Egyptian army to fight um, the Saudi, the, the House of Saud, um, the first Saudi state, and they, you know, they um, they take them prisoners. And they put them to death in Constantinople, and there's huge celebration that these, you know, these fringe guys who represent this, you know, ultra orthodox version that no one is really keen on, which was not the mainstream, which was really on the fringes that, you know, these guys have been gotten rid of, and so, you know, the forefathers of Mohammed bin Salman who, um, you know, most likely ordered the killing of Jamal Khashoggi were the Ottomans and the Turks. And so the, you know, Erdogan finds it rather convenient to, you know, poke the Saudis with, um, with this episode as he poses, uh, when he poses as the defender of, of democracy or, or freedom of, of the press, um, just to irk, irk the Saudis and revive some of that, some of that uh, rivalry. Yeah, thank you so much for, for that perspective too and, and, and understanding um, the greater issues. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and you touched upon ISIS or ISIL and the ideology um, that Saudi Arabia doesn't really have control of these groups anymore. Uh, we have a question from, from Pat Hurden. He um, sees this ideology and ISIL being metastasized globally. Um, and he's wondering, are there any relative, sorry, what does the US Navy, NATO, Russia, as well as the Arab and Persian um, states do to the vestige of the caliphate? Um, so how can we best approach um, this ideology that I, uh, maybe that is what you mentioned earlier, is now not really under control of, of Saudi Arabia or Wahhabism, and, and how does that, what do we do about it? Um, is it now inherent to those places? You know, I think that's a very broad question that should occupy policymakers in Washington, because I think that the the drive towards sort of the war on terror has only made things worse and i think we need to reframe how we approach this problem first of all um i, I want to uh you know make clear that uh, people in the muslim world are the biggest and first victims of these groups and so it is in my view always a small minority of crazies against the large majority of us all, uh, you know, peace-loving people in, in the Arab world and the Muslim world and in the US. So in terms of defining the other, for me, the other are these crazies. And I, I have no qualms calling them, uh, calling them crazies because I do think that one way to better understand the problem is to look at it from a perspective of how do gangs form? How do criminal gangs form? Um, because it is about belonging, it is about identity, it is about unemployment, um, it is about radicalization. Um, and some of these problems are not specific to Islam. They are specific to how uh, radical groups form uh, everywhere not just not just um not just in this region well thank you so much we want to respect your time um yeah i want to thank you again for joining us today um everyone who has questions thank you so much for attending um and we'll hopefully see you here in person at ut in the, in the near future thank you so much for for having me it was really a pleasure to speak to you, to get these excellent questions, um, to meet you virtually, uh, Ruby and, and, and Bianca and, and, and every one of you and the students who attended the colloquium just before. Um, it's really been a pleasure and I do absolutely hope that I can visit you in person in the not too distant future. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for listening. Thank you. And for everyone who's still around, don't forget Black Wave, uh, Kim Rato's book is, is a fantastic resource for anyone interested in, in the Middle East and understanding the complexities of the region. So highly, highly recommend.
All right, thank you so much.